Hi, I'm Mark from Nomad Boat Building. Welcome to the workshop. So today I've got a simple job to do. I've got to make up a bunch of little parts for a local place that does furniture design and manufacturing. In fact, there's two jobs. There's making up these wooden parts right here. And there's also producing these little brackets. Now, these came to me as a pre-produced item, but they needed a bunch of modifications. And so I just wanna talk about some simple jigging techniques that will help you do repetitive operations quickly. These aren't necessarily universal jigging techniques, but it's just an example of how I take an operation that's relatively simple, put a little bit more effort into doing a bit of jigging up and get the whole thing done a whole lot more quickly. I gotta do 32 of these and so that means a whole bunch of operations repeated, and it's well worth taking the time to do a bit of jigging for that. It should go without saying that consistent stock is one of the most important things when we're doing repetitive operations. So to that end, I dressed this material out, and I made sure I ran it through the planer on all four faces. And that's because even if I had just ripped it to a consistent width on the table saw, Sure enough, there's gonna be just a little bit of shape that happens in the edges of this that's gonna cause me to have not exactly the same thickness all the way through. Because I was working with longer stock, about eight feet long, there's no point in trying to use a jointer. The jointer I have is really quite small and junky. It's fine for my needs when I need to do a little bit of sort of furniture stuff and the parts are, you know, a couple of feet long. It'll joint that stuff okay. But anything else, it's just not really worth it. And so I've learned to get along without a jointer. I use a sled on my table saw to do major ripping to sort of straighten up one edge and then I'll take that straightened edge and I'll run that against the table saw fence in order to get my parallel sides. Now my very first cut on the miter saw is to get rid of the snipe on the end and to give myself a block to reference to when I do my first bit of jigging. And my first attempt at it was knocking off a very short piece and I wasn't really thinking much about the snipe. I was thinking about getting rid of the snipe, but I wasn't thinking about how it was going to affect my jig. So when I went to go and try and make a jig out of it, I found that the snipe, which reduces that thickness a little bit, was messing around with my orientation and it wasn't allowing me to get the accuracy that I wanted. That's when I just knocked off a longer piece off a different piece of stock to start all over again. You want to make sure this is long enough that it gets past your snipe on the very end because that's going to be reduced a little bit in thickness and so if you try and clamp to that it's going to throw off the angle of this sort of thing. Now one modification I made to this little block was to chop a little rabbit out of this inside corner and to bevel off the outside edges here. That's because I want the next cut that I butt up against it to nestle in here without any junk getting hanging it up in that inside corner. So that little recess is just to make sure that I don't get any stuff that's gonna screw up the cut. If you're pushing too far this way or you're standing far that way, this guy's gonna end up being the wrong length. Once I have a block knocked off to make my jig out of, I need a part that's gonna be my reference part to jig everything to. So I accurately measure and cut my very first piece. With that in place, I can set up my jig. Now the jig operation is pretty simple. All it really is is a stop block set a certain distance away from the blade. I'll bring the blade down. We want to make sure we're referencing off the teeth of the blade and not off the face of the blade, which is going to give us a slightly different result. Even registering off the teeth isn't really the best method, but it's the best place to start. You reference off the teeth, you set up your stop blocks, you do a test cut and then you compare that to your original test piece. So in this case, I run my end piece or my stock block up against my fence. And what I want to do is I want to give myself a more positive reference. Because this material has got an angle cut on the end, it's easy for it to sort of slide out and out of the way. So I mentioned that we knock the corners off the stock block to allow for some dust to escape. But another thing we'll do is we'll put a little keeper on the face of it so that this corner can register up against this a little more nicely. We also want to raise this up off of this table surface so that no sawdust is collecting in behind it. And so I'll just put a little spacer on there to start with and we'll drop a clamp on the whole works. So the spacer we remove, this little piece of plywood against the face is acting as a keeper to make sure that the end of our block is registered nicely. And of course, we have the inside corner of the stop block chopped away so that no dust can collect in there. And now we have a reasonably accurate jig that we can use. As we're using this, we make a cut. 
we pull that finished part out and then the next piece we flip over in order to make the next one which is where we gain a whole bunch of material efficiency and speed but it's because we're doing that that we have to make sure that we've thickness this properly so that we end up with a consistent part time and time again and if you're doing multiples of stuff always make sure you make a few extra because we're repeating things we don't want to repeat mistakes got to make sure that we can get this done right so once you've got your test piece Make sure you write test on it and make sure you don't incorporate this into the rest of your build because you need to be able to come back to this and reference other parts off of it as you go. For that reason, I didn't drill the holes into this. I've just left my markings on there with a nice crisp knife line down the middle that I can put reference points onto very, very easily and accurately. Now let's pop over to the drill press where I've got it set up to drill these holes. At the drill press, you can see our offcuts from the last operation being used as stop blocks, and I have an airline and a vacuum set up to carry away wood chips. I have a Forstner bit chucked into the drill, which is going to give me the cleanest, most accurate results. My first jigging position is allowing me to drill a hole right in the center. And you'll notice the stop block on the right has a little notch cut into it that allows me to get my thumb in there to slide this block across to the next stop block position. So this simple jig setup has allowed me to drill two of the three holes I need. Now in order to make it accommodate drilling three holes with one setup would have taken a whole bunch more ingenuity and thought. The size of this job isn't big enough to really put that much effort into it. So I decided the simpler thing to do was to just drill the two holes in all the blocks and then retweak the jig in order to drill the third hole. So for setting up for the next one, what I do is I use this little test piece that just has my centers marked on it. And so what I'll do is I'll unclamp this block right here and we'll just slide this down, center up on my center line. And while that's there, I'll just very carefully just tack this in place with the clamp just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere while I set up the blocking for it. Yeah, that looks good. Now, because I've got to operate this with my right hand, it's preferable if the stop block for this is probably on the right hand side so that this hand can push the block into it to keep it secured. Two clamps on there for safety, and now I'm good to go. I've just got sort of a test piece here that I just do a little ch first uh, test on. You'll notice I have two test pieces. One of them that just has my bare bones markings on it for setting up the jigs. And then the other one just to make sure that that setup is accurate before I move on to my finished parts. Now I'll check the accuracy of my jig setup by using the layout lines in the first test piece and line them up against the edges of the holes on the second one. If everything's nice and accurate, then I'm good to go. Now I'll just go ahead and I'll finish drilling all the rest. Now a simple technique I often use for two and three stage drilling operations is to use a butt hinge to act as a flip down stop. I'll attach it to the backing piece of this setup and flip it down to bear up against the end of the part and locate a hole at an intermediate spot. However, because of the angled cuts on these parts, I decided it wasn't a good fit. So they gave me these brackets right here and needed these wings chopped off of it, like so. So I needed to come up with a way to do that relatively efficiently. And so I made up this little block here. I drilled holes to index these press-in fittings. Put the magnets back on to demonstrate this. And so I left me with this right here. So this block is cut to my finished length, as you can see. So that allowed me to take these brackets and just run them through the bandsaw like so, just following the end of my block in order to chop them off. So that gave me a fairly consistent cut. I then dropped the block into my vise here, and then just using a one inch belt sander, was able to sort of clean these guys up and give me a reasonable finish. It's a tight enough fit that I need to use something to pry it off. Now what I need to do is drill a hole into each of these guys on either side, equally spaced. So I'm going to keep using this exact same jig and attach this to a piece of plywood that I can clamp down onto my drill press 
and we're going to center it up underneath that hole. Then all I need to do is drill my hole, flip it around, drill another one. Now there's a separate countersinking operation you need to do as well. And I'd love to be able to do it all in one shot, but I don't have the ability to do that. Starting with a clearance hole, which is going to be 3 16 of an inch. And I'm hoping I can just drill that without having to center punch or without having to do a smaller pilot hole. But if that doesn't work on my first couple shots, I'm going to have to go and make it a three-step operation, which is certainly annoying, but that's not much I can do about it. We'll just start by centering this up generally. So I'm going to end up being right about there. Need room to clamp. So about there should work fine. A couple of staples. That ought to work. that off in order to do the clamping. can see I'm off a little bit and I find the easiest thing to do is just tap my block when that's the case. That looks better. All right, well, that appears to be working just fine. So I think I'm good to go ahead and drill all of these. A little bit of deburring is gonna be necessary at the uh, end of the operation, but that's not a big deal. So whenever I have these repetitive jig operations, uh, what I find is you get uh, chips and sawdust and things like that building up around the jig and that can make things difficult. So I always, keep an airline close at hand and I'll even just clamp it right to the ceiling here. You can see I've just got a spring clamp holding this thing just at the right spot so that I can give this a quick blast without having to waste a lot of movement to do it. So that'll speed things up, help keep everything accurate moving smoothly. Probably don't need to lubricate on every hole. I bet the drill bit gets enough lubrication on it that I only need to do it once in a while. As I proceed through these repetitive operations, I'm always looking for little areas of improvement I can make on the fly in order to speed up the entire process. I can already see one simple improvement I can make to this jig, and that is just, I think it's just whittling a corner off here a little tiny bit so I can get my tool under there more easily. Let's find out. Wrong one. Yeah. Even by using a small tool like this, this um, 
multi-master blade, I can keep it in my hand, it's small and light, instead of using a larger pry bar. That's all I need. Sometimes I've even gone so far as to remove the arms from the drill press that I don't need for the particular operation because there's always one that's optimal for making the, the pass you need to do. And so you can see that this one gets in my way of my arm a little bit. Rather than grabbing this one and overextending, I'd be better off taking this off so that I grab the most efficient one. Okay, so there we are. There's our little uh, brackets done. So each one of these brackets, beyond the actual manufacturing, which I didn't do, but just the modification, took 10 individual separate operations. Chopping off the arms, two operations. Cleaning up the ends, two operations. Drilling the pilot holes, two operations. Countersinking, two operations. Deburring the back of the hole, two operations. It's 10 operations, 32 pieces, 320 operations. All thanks done quickly thanks to this one very simple jig that essentially had three holes drilled in it. The, the last hole was just uh, the, the result of doing all the other holes. So that worked pretty good. This thing's actually still quite tight. It didn't, uh, with all those operations, it's, it's still fairly accurate. So time well spent. And that's what jigging is all about. But I only had one or two of these to do, I'd probably just mark them individually and drill them. I might, I might have actually, if I had just to do two, I might have stacked them and then clamped them in my drill press vise. I've got this little drill press vise. It's got a nice little step in it, so that aligns things nicely. I probably would have ganged them up to try and do that, but beyond that, it gets repetitive and starts to become worthwhile to do some jigging. Here we are with our corner blocks installed into these components for this modular sofa designed and built by Part and Hole in Victoria. And our metal parts aren't shown, they're in a different component. Here's one of those modules upholstered in a beautiful gray wool material. This is just one of the three different shaped modules that you can put together and rearrange into any configuration to suit the room that you're putting it into. The rectilinear backrest may not look very accommodating, but it's been very carefully designed with foam components of different densities that make for an extremely compressible and comfortable result. I can tell you for a fact this piece of furniture has spent years in the design phase to get up to this point. All right, that's it folks, so we're done. We got basically two batches of parts, one of them in metal, one of them in wood, but to make these parts beyond even the dressing down of the material in order to start producing these parts, I have 520 individual operations in order to produce 32 of these and 32 of these. That's quite a bit. That's well worth jigging up for. All right, that's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you find that useful. I want to thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, all that sort of stuff. If you can help me out on Patreon, I really appreciate that too. Find links up in the corner or down in the description. Till next time, see y'all later.